John chapter number 5, verse number 24. John chapter number 5, verse number 24. It was very appropriate for this morning in the baptismal service, and it happens to be the next set of verses that we are going through. In John chapter number 25, uh, John chapter 5, verse 24. While you're finding it, you remember last week we spoke about uh, Jesus more than an avatar. Right? That's absolutely the truth. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little thought on that while we're finding that. Jesus is more than an avatar. He's in, because an avatar is a projection of a person into a character that is not real. Jesus is real. And God was in him re reconciling the world to himself. Jesus is not a shadow of God, but an actual manifestation of the divine one in his creation. Defined in a person of cognizance and intelligence, an expression of himself more profound than the beauties and the intelligence of his own design and nature. Oh yes, he is definitely more than an avatar. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at John chapter number 5. And we want you to read with me in verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Father, in the few moments that we have here this morning, I pray that you would give us unction from on high, Lord, to be able to understand these verses, Father, and to appreciate them, Father. I know that these are ones that uh, are very spiritual and often profound and require some thought and discipline to, to take some time and to chew on, Father. But I pray this morning I would give a foundation for the people, Lord, to go home and to really think through these verses and some of the passages that we'll be looking at in John for themselves. I pray that your congregation will go home knowing that we are generally going through the Gospel of John. That they would take the time, Lord, to read ahead and to chew on the verses, chew on the passages, meditate on them, Lord. So the Heavenly Father, when it comes time to hear them in the sermon, Lord, they might get even more out of it for their own spiritual enrichment. Father, we bless you, Father. We're very thankful for Laura who followed you in baptism this morning, Lord. We know that, Heavenly Father, the, the enemy had thrown so many monkey wrenches, Lord, so many little things in our way this morning, Father, but you have cleared the road, Lord, for her to be able to give this testimony. We thank you for the grace that you have given her this morning, this congregation, Lord. I thank you for their patience. I pray that your Holy Spirit manifests the presence of Christ in us here right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. These verses really do require some chewing on. I, I think it's kind of trippy. If you're reading it in English, you're just easily going to trip right over what's being said. Uh, but you'll have to remember that the, the Bible, though we have in our, our traditional Bible, the King James Bible, is an excellent translation. And in it, we have uh, some things that are presented that helps to get through some of the spiritual meaning that's uh, being brought forth. But you remember the New Testament was dominantly inspired by God in Greek. And at that time, the Greek language uh, was spoken from almost the places of India and Afghanistan all the way through to Rome. It was the intellectual language, the philosophical language. It was a trade language. Alexander the Great had saw to it. In fact, I read uh, recently Alexander the Great when he had uh, gone to India and intended to conquer the the in this valley and when he had done that of course you know the famous story he, he, he sat down and cried that at his young tender age in the late 20s there was no more of the world to conquer I think he didn't know that there was so much more out there but he had intended to retire to Yemen <laughs> There in the mountains on the east coast of Yemen on the Red Sea, just absolutely beautiful valleys. And there, there's an area around Sana where the capital of Yemen is. It's not very nice today. The Houthis over there are wreaking havoc into the world and creating death and destruction and chaos and fear amongst their people. But it is phenomenally beautiful. In fact, one of the cities in southern Yemen is called Aden or Eden. Because the beauty in that area is considered the pearl or the jewel of the, the area. Just tremendous. Well, the Greek language had proliferated everywhere. People spoke it because that's how business was done. 
Greek language is very unique because it has declinations and conjugations and in it, it relates a lot of idea that for spirituality's sake, uh, is able to kind of tap into what God was trying to, to get forth to people. I mean, for hundreds of years, the language developed from uh, what they would call classical Greek. Some people might call it ancient Greek. Some people might even think that the Bible is written in ancient Greek. It's not. The Bible is written in Koine Greek. And you say, Pastor, you're giving us a big uh, intellectual lesson this morning. The important thing is it communicated profound ideas. Because after 500 years of the philosophers, Socrates and Plato and, and all the rest, having used the language quickly to, to, to move from classical Greek into Koine Greek and the proliferation around the world and the, the pollution of words from all these different languages as they consumed other cultures, it became a very good language to communicate metaphysical, metaphysical and spiritual and, and difficult ideas. There were nuances in the, in the words. It's basically an aorist tense language, but when they go outside of the aorist tense, it is on purpose to communicate to you. And when you read this passage of Scripture, you, you find it kind of trippy. And it's very good Greek, and it is really spiritual, because there's something trying to be communicated. In English, you, you might find it a little difficult. That's why it's important that you just don't run over Scripture if you don't understand it. A lot of us today, we just want things easy. Hey... Alexa, what does this passage mean? <laughs> Make it easy for me, right? Uh, that's that's the, the world we live in. Everybody wants something super easy. They don't want to reach for anything. They don't want anything hard or difficult. But I got to tell you, if you're, if you're going to reach uh, spiritual understanding, it's not going to come to you easy. God put low-hanging fruit there for a reason, but there are good fruit a little higher up in the tree and he's not going to just bring it down for you he's going to bring you up to it on purpose because when he cultivated a desire to really understand something to really chomp into something to get a bite of something you know it makes you appreciate it more when you have to reach for it or struggle for it or long for it when you get it it's sweeter this week, I thank you for all those who, who uh, in, in compatriot with me you know I lost 15 pounds this week <laughs> Can you imagine that 15 pounds I lost this week? But uh, my purpose was, was more than just for health, because I did do it for my health. It's a good thing. We fasted this week. My wife and I fasted. She fasted three days. She said, Poppy, that's enough. I can't stand it. <laughs> but God's grace, my last meal was uh, Sunday night. I had some homemade gyro with this Middle Eastern style rice that I had made and a nice salad on it. And uh, that's, it, it was quick. One of the guys told me on Thursday, what was your last meal? I knew it right like that. I bet you can't remember what you had for dinner two days ago. Man, I knew what I had when my last meal was. Uh, God's grace, he sustained me through, through five days. My, my breaking fast was yesterday morning. So from Sunday night to Saturday morning, and several people in the church took some time, and they fasted and prayed with me, and I really appreciate that. There's a spirit of unity, and I can feel your prayers. I'll be honest, I can feel your prayers for me. And uh, it was a bit of time of, of spiritual renewal for me. I, I, I really got a lot out of it this time. And this is my 20th time doing it in the last 10 years, but uh, I, could, I could really feel the benefit. And I, after eating 24 hours, I feel much better except that I really ate too much yesterday and I shouldn't have. But there is spiritual renewal there. But here's the point. When you reach for something, you long for something, you work at something and it's denied you for a while, it's amazing that when you finally get it, it is so sweet. My break fast meal is my traditional one. I eat refried black beans. You know my wife is Guatemalan. So I eat refried black beans she gets me some queso fresco and the crema. She makes me a couple plantains. You think a plate like this. No, no, a plate like this. <laughs> That's all it is. And I tell you, you put that first bite in your mouth and you know something just as simple as that, it tastes better than it has in a year. It's unbelievable how intense the flavors are, the smells are, your mouth waters, you put it in there, you can feel all these things happening in your blood sugar and, and all kinds of things going on, but this, this sweet taste of satisfaction, you eat it slowly and it is like nothing you've ever had before because you finally got it. 
And there are a lot of things in the scripture that you long for. And sometimes God denies it to you for a while intellectually. But eventually he says, you're not ready for it. I have to build a foundation here. Fill a foundation here for you to understand. And, and when we build up to it, I will give it to you. But you long for it and you reach for it. And sometimes you pray about it and you ask God, God, help me to understand this. And that longing, that cultivating of, uh, of a desire is important. Because we don't appreciate things when they come to us easy, do we? And there are things in the scripture that are precious. And God holds it just a little out of reach. Because if you don't really want it, you won't appreciate it. If you don't really want it, you won't appreciate it because it's precious. And understanding it is precious. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's almost all verbs, apart from the aorist tense. It's pretty profound. Let me, let me read it to you. <clears throat> And uh, how it would literally render. Now, keep in mind, when you see the TH on the end of a word in the King James Bible, people didn't really speak like that all the time 400 years ago. The TH at the end of a verb in the King James Bible is there for a reason. It is telling you that the translator is translating the present active indicative form. It's kind of like putting an ING on the end of a word. But it's to let you know that an action has started and the action is going and there's no sight in the future of it ending. It's like a ray. It has a starting point and it shoots off forever. The action is ongoing and that's important. A little rendering would be amen, amen. I looked at the Greek text yesterday and I said, you know what, this is good for the congregation. Let me give you an exact. It doesn't read nicely in English at all. Amen, amen, I say unto you, or I say to you, that he, the words of me are hearing and are believing. The one or the one who sends, the one who sent me is having life everlasting. So believing the one who sent thee, if you're the one doing that, you're having, is having, is having life. That's a state of being. Not just life, but is having everlasting life as a state of being. And not into judgment, damnation. This judgment is interesting. This is a, a, a condemnation that happens at the end of a guilty verdict at a trial. From a tribunal that has judged you. So this is, and not in the damnation as a state of being shall come or shall be coming into, but is past. That's a state of being as well in the perfect tense, is past. I mean, something happened and now it is no longer happening and you are in a different place. Out of death, or out of the death, being the state of being, into the life. You can see why they don't translate word for word exactly in the order that it is. That, that's very difficult, right? It doesn't read well in English. It doesn't communicate everything you need to without somebody like me standing up here and telling you what the Greek is trying to tell you. But wow, that is profound. It's all about a state of being of your soul. So as we're looking at that, I want you to know, number one, that Jesus demonstrates for everybody or everybody's need for forgiveness as they are in a state of pending doom. Let's uh, move from here and go to Matthew. I want to go through some of the Matthew to set the foundation for this. So Matthew chapter number five is where we'll begin. We're going to read a series of verses. I'm going to stay dominantly in Matthew, but move in a couple places a little bit later on. I apologize for starting so late today because of our baptism. When you, uh, when we are finished, we do provide lots of food. There's tons of food that's been more or less catered for us this morning. and Some homemade food. I know you'll appreciate it. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 21. <clears throat> Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. 
That means in danger of being damned or condemned. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Raka being a fool, it's a, a kind of a condemnation. Looking down on somebody in that way. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. You say, well, that's pretty profound. It seems kind of harsh. Well, it says a lot of things like that. Go to chapter number 10 of Matthew. Jesus is going to establish, as he came into the New Testament, a foundation of understanding how God sees us. For when he came into the New Testament period, he came into Judaism in the world, they had had the law for many, many, many years. And if you've been sitting with me in Sunday school over the last couple months, if we explained it to you, that the Jews had this law, excuse me, on Wednesday night for our Wednesday night prayer meetings, the Jews had this law, but they had really gotten off base with the spirit of the law, and Jesus was coming to correct it. The first part of his ministry, for the first year or two of his ministry, he spent correcting their thinking about the practice of the spirit of the law. Many of them were good about keeping the letter of the law. But then finding loopholes for their sinful intent. Chapter number 10, verse number 15. Going to chapter 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for that city. Well, why? Well, because he had come preaching the gospel and they had rejected it. He had come preaching the kingdom of peace and they rejected it. They wanted their own way to God. They wanted their own strength to God. They wanted their own goodness and righteousness to be enough for God. Uh, the Bible is very clear that there is none righteous, no, not one. We have all turned aside. We have all gone astray. That is why the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Go to chapter number 11, verse number 22. <clears throat> He's also condemning them again. <clears throat> Has he been preaching the gospel and straightening out their theology and their understanding as is understood in the Sermon on the Mount and the, the Beatitudes and, and the various things about how they have been practicing the religion, straighten out how they prayed with God, how they fasted, how they gave their money to God and the charity. He straightened all these things out, trying to help them to understand what it was that God was really looking for out of them. He was preaching righteousness and they just would not. They would not come to him, they would not repent. And in verse number 20, then they began to upbraid the cities uh, wherein most of his mighty works were done. They saw the miracles, they heard the preaching, they loved the miracles, they hated the preaching. Because they repented not, the Bible says. They didn't change their heart. That's what repentance means. It's a change of heart, change of mind. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which is exalted unto the heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Meaning they would have repented and not been judged. Go to chapter number 12, verse number 36. <clears throat> Jesus warns them about what's in their heart. Look in church, verse number 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and the evil man... Out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account therefore in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thy sh thou shalt be condemned. A little bit cryptic, but uh, your confession in Jesus Christ will save you. But the many, many words that we speak throughout our lives will condemn us. Every single one of them is recorded, even if we don't remember them. And it is reminded and kept. 
right there. In verse number 41 and 42, it says, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they, have, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And yet, they didn't change their hearts. They didn't change their mind. In chapter number 23, this goes on for quite some time, but I'm just giving you some of the highlights. In chapter number 23, he is dealing with the Pharisees, the religious crowd. I mean, this really is, for all intents and purposes, the religious leadership and their hypocrisies that he's dealing with. And he is demonstrating that the law cannot make you righteous. Just trying to do the good things and not do the bad things isn't good enough. It won't get you there. Because here he is in chapter number 23 dealing with, well, quite frankly, the, the, the people and the scribes and the Pharisees. And look at verse number 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier things. The uh, uh, weightier things of the law. I mean, obviously, they were supposed to tithe of their financial gains, and they did. But these people were so meticulous in their understanding of the law that in their gardens, their personal gardens, they would bring a tenth of the increase from their mint and their cumin, the, the, the herbs of their garden, they would take that as an offering to God as a good faith thing and, and well, praise God. He says, Jesus doesn't condemn that at all. He says, but you're so careful to do this aspect, but then you ignore, it says, the weightier things of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, meaning the ties you ought to have done, but not left the other undone. He says, you're blind. In verse 24, ye blind guides, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. In any rules-based religion, that's the nature of it. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? I mean, we've got some religious Jews. I, I know. I've been pastoring here now two years and... and Memorial Baptist Church here in Park Slope for 22 years. I pastored Bensonhurst Baptist. I still live in Bensonhurst, but to get here, I got to go through Borough Park. Every day I travel to my secular job, I travel through Borough Park. But you know, we're right on the edge, and, and, and over in Bensonhurst, we used to have a little house of ill repute, a, a prostitution establishment that they put up uh, right next to our our church. And, and, and Chinese folks have brought in these young girls. And uh, it was just a shame. We tried to win them to Jesus. Eventually, we, my wife, through her great efforts, and some other people in the neighborhood pressed. And they, the congressman's office, Nadler, finally put, uh, was it Nadler? Who was it? Where, which one? It was Nadler. Yeah, well, one of them, our, our congressman, finally, she kept calling the office and saying, you got to do something, say, right. After two years, they finally shut it down. They sent the DOB in to shut it down. And uh, we don't know if the girls just get moved or what, but we stopped it from being right there. But you know what was interesting? Who, who do you think frequented the little house of ill repute, the tiny little Chinese girls who look like they were barely teenagers or out of their teens? We'd have Jews coming in all the time. At the end of our block, down on 66th Street, just around the corner for, for almost two years before the DOB came in and shut that one down. Had two little Spanish girls and the light-skinned black chick, and they worked this place. She would sit out there when it was warm in her spandex underwear, looking all stoned out of her mind like she's on heroin. And guess who frequented that one? I'll give you a little hint. What kind of a, a, a house of ill repute closes on Friday night at 6 o'clock and opens on Saturday night at 6? That's how much of their clientele were Hasidic Jews. They pull up and they park. They go up there. The little camera would see who they are. The little door would open. Half hour later, they come out. I'm in their store. They won't even put the money in my hand. They don't want to touch a Gentile to put my change in my hand. They put it on the table and shove it at me. But I had no problem going into a Gentile. You strain at a gnat, the Bible says, and swallow a camel. 
You get all particular about sillinesses. You won't even turn your own gas fire stove off if the kids bump it on a Sabbath. You'll bring a Gentile in to turn the handle to save your life, but then you have no problem taking drugs or buying drugs off of off Gentiles, going into Gentile prostitutes because wives are for procreation and shishka or Gentile lovers are for recreation. Strain it in that, swallow a camel. The Bible says you hypocrites. You hypocrites. Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. But he showed that the law is not good enough. The law says all kinds of things you cannot do, and yet people who are bound by the law always find a way out to get what they want, to do what they want. Oh, Jesus demonstrated to his public ministry that man's righteousness was not good enough. They needed a savior. He demonstrated that everybody needs forgiveness. And there's a little bit of hope. Go to <coughs> Mark. Chapter number four, quick. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. First you have to realize how God sees you. You know, recently we bought some meat and, and you buy the meat and it's in the cryogenic pack and you bring it home because it's a big hassle, you know. I love to get those ribs and we brought home some ribs and uh, they look good. Everything on the outside looked fine. They smelled fine from the outside. It was a clear package. You didn't see any green or, or, or the meat hadn't changed color. We got that thing open and oh, you know, it just hits you, doesn't it? Especially with pork. You, you get that smell and the rancid, it's bad. It's bad. Now from the outside, it looked good. But on the inside, once you opened it up and saw, and saw what was really inside and smelled what was inside, you realized it was bad. I took that thing back. The lady, she didn't even look at it. All I had to do, I put it in a, in a, in a trash bag. She just opened it up. She says, yep, here's your money back. Go get another. <laughs> you bet, because ribs aren't cheap anymore. Three, four dollars a pound. You want those things to be right. But you know what it is, is we can't hide anything from God. There is absolutely nothing that God does not see. And Jesus of Matthew sets the foundation for judging and shows that not merely the outward action by the inward intent and evil that God sees also. Our outward silence does not fail us from God's sight. God sees us when we can't. We as humans, we can't always smell through <clears throat> the cryogenic pack of people. There are a lot of people who look good on the outside, but on the inside they're rotten. Jesus says, you're like whitewashed sepulchre, but you're full of dead men's bones and rottenness. But see, God is not stymied by the veil of our flesh, the outward appearance, the, the projection of who we are to other people. God sees you inside and out the same. He knows who you are in your heart. He knows who you are in your thoughts. Which is why Jesus spent so much time demonstrated through the book of Matthew addressing the issue of the heart. That God is judging not how well you can keep the letter of the law but the spirit of the law within you. But Mark chapter 4 tells us that we can be forgiven. There are those who have blinded themselves and, and stopped their ears and have gone deaf. And their heart refuses to understand. But if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand, you may be forgiven. Going back to Mark, uh, Matthew, let's go to chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 18 through 20, we're going to see that Jesus can forgive you. Everybody needs forgiveness, but Jesus can forgive you and take you from a state of pending doom to a state of relief. Verse 18. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, 
My beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall, not, shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. <clears throat> Chapter 28. Chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. This is very, very familiar to you. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way into the end of the world. Amen. And Matthew chapter number 9. Verse number six. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take thy bed, and go into thy house. Christ has the power to forgive your sins. Go with me quickly to Luke chapter number seven. Let's read there. Jesus is the one who has the power to forgive your sins. Chapter 7, verses 47 and 48. This woman had anointed Jesus' head and feet, and there were critics out there. And Jesus responds to them, Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Jesus demonstrates everybody needs forgiveness. From a state of pending doom, Jesus can forgive you and bring you a state of relief. But lastly, in Jesus, you are forgiven. And you're in a state of of freedom. Oh, there is forgiveness. Amen. <clears throat> Let's go to Romans chapter number four. Romans chapter number four, verse number seven. Verse 6, even as David also described the blessedness of a man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord will not impute sin. Here we are coming this week to the high holy days of the Hebrew calendar. One of the days is the Yom Kippur, the day of covering, the day where they believe God covers the sins of people. They believe it's happening in heaven, your sins are covered, but what are they covering it with? They have no offering, they have no temple, they have no sacrifice. They have no sacrifice or offering because God has made an offering for them. Jesus Christ, the high priest, became prophet, priest, and king, and the ultimate offering. When he offered up himself on the cross. So that their sins could not merely be covered, for here we're quoting the Old Testament. The Bible's quoting the Old Testament of itself. But in the New Testament, the Bible says Jesus Christ does more than cover your sins. The Bible says he takes them away, nailing them to the cross. Go to Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 13. 
We'll see in verse number 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having done what? Forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And what did he do? Did he simply cover them? Did he take all the charges on the paper that are against you that on the day of judgment would be laid out to convict you of your sin and your guilt? No, the Bible says right here, the charges that were against you were literally taken off the page, blotting out the handwriting, blotting it out taking it off the page of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took those charges out of the way, nailing it to his own cross. He took your guilty charges and he took it upon himself in his own body and nailed it to the cross, paying the penalty for your sins. Jesus said, you're guilty and I will pay for your crime. And you find forgiveness when you agree with Jesus and say, I'm guilty. I believe you paid for my crimes. Ephesians chapter number 4. Verse number 32. The Bible says when you believe in Jesus Christ and you've received that forgiveness, not merely your sins are covered, but taken away. Which is better, amen? Would you say that's better? That's what makes Christianity the better covenant than the Hebrew covenant. The Hebrew covenant was temporary where sins were merely covered. In Jesus Christ, our sins are taken away. In Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 32, the Bible says, and be, excuse me, in verse number 30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Is that awesome? You are in a state of forgiveness. Your sins have been not merely covered, but taken off of the page, nailed to the cross. And now, if you have trusted it and been born again, you're in a state of freedom, and God has sealed that freedom with the gift of Himself. The Bible says the sealing is the Spirit of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed. How long? until the day of redemption. The verses that we previously read, how many of your sins were paid for? All our transgressions nailed to the cross. We are in a state of forgiveness in 1 John chapter number 2 as we're wrapping this up. We're running full circle to the Apostle John toward the end of the <coughs> New Testament. First John chapter number 2 and verse number 12. The great John the Apostle who wrote the Gospel of John and his theology, of course, will be similar between piece to piece. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are, they are forgiven you for his namesake. That is a state of being, isn't it? Your sins are forgiven you. This makes a little more sense when you read the context of John chapter 5, verse number 24. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, amen, amen, I say unto you, he that heareth my word as a consequence, instead of rejecting my word, believes my word, right? And believeth on him that sent me. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4, it says, The word preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in the, hear, in the heart of the hearers. When you hear the word of God and you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you trust in it and you believe in it with all your heart, it starts off a cascade of miracles. 
And the first miracle that happens is when you reach out your hand to God and say, Oh God, I am a sinner and I do believe the gospel and I believe Jesus died for me. Please forgive all my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Give me that new life. And you repent to the Lord, change your heart, change your mind, and look to Him. The Bible says you're believing on Him that's in half everlasting life. A miracle happens. He'll make you born again. There's a lot of people who intellectually believe. From the time they were ch children, they were taught about Jesus in Sunday school and saw the little pictures and diagrams. And, um, if you're old as me, they had the little felt people. So you go about your life and you live your life and somewhere in the background you know there's a God and you, you fear God and when you get in trouble every once in a while you pray. You're not repenting of your sins, you just want to get away from the cops. <laughs> or you don't want to get caught. People get real religious when they're about to get caught. But there's got to be a time in your life where you are confronted with the truth of yourself and the truth of the gospel. And where the Holy Spirit is working you over and there is a struggle inside and you have got to come down on the right side of the fence, a point of decision in your life where Jesus is calling you to himself and saying, what do you really believe about me? What do you know about me and what do you really believe about me? And there is a point in each and every one of our lives where we must come to that moment. And in your heart, between you and God, you surrender and say, God, you know, I do believe in you. I do believe you died for me and I know who I am. I know what I am. It's at that moment the hands of your heart can reach out and ask forgiveness. And just like the woman whose sins were many are forgiven, he says, go your way. Your sins are forgiven. You shall not come into condemnation. But is past, that means something has happened and it's completed in the past. You've passed from a state of death and you have passed into a state of life. That perfect tense, hath everlasting life. Completed action with continuing ongoing results. At one moment you were born again. And the result is you stay alive. Sealed under the day of redemption. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes as our time is up. I appreciate your patience this morning with our unusual service. A regular service. I know that many of you are faithful and I really appreciate you as our musicians come forward. But we can lead them down here. I want to ask you to take a moment to reflect on what you've heard this morning. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? Have you taken the time in your own heart to really ask, have, have I had that moment in my life? Have you had an opportunity to kind of struggle with God and to, to make a decision and end up on the right side of the fence? We'll, we'll take a few moments here. Let's reflect on that. Jesus Christ give you the peace that passes all understanding. To as many as received him, to them them gave you the power to become the sons of God. Even to them who believe on his name, which were not born of the, the flesh, were not born of the will of men, but they were born of God. Heavenly Father loves you. Jesus is gracious. 
He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has opened a door of grace that whosoever will may come, and if you would hear his voice, not merely the pastor's voice, but the one that whispers through your heart. Do you have ears to hear? Have you turned them on? Do you have spiritual eyes to see? Is your heart tuned to understanding spiritual things? Maybe you've been asleep for a long time. It starts with a little prayer in your heart to God. Oh God, show me. God, I believe you're real, but show me. Show me what the truth is. Help me to hear your still small voice. Help me to see you for the, who you are, the truth that's hidden from me now, Lord. Give me a heart to understand. If you don't have one of those this morning, I can't give it to you, but God can. But you got to reach to Him. Reach out to Him. The prayer of faith. Save His name.